Science is the great antidote to the poison of enthusiasm and superstition. Hi, I'm Juliette Selgren, and this is my podcast, The Great Antidote, named for Adam Smith, brought to you by Liberty Fund. To learn more, visit www.adamsmithworks.org. Welcome back. Today, on November 8th, 2023, we're going to be talking about a few things. We're going to be talking about women and economic freedom. We're also just going to be talking about expanding economic freedoms generally um, and what that looks like in different places with respect to different groups of people. Uh, I'm excited to welcome Carrie Ann Lawson onto the podcast to talk about the subject. She is a faculty, uh, faculty scholar. I almost said faculty senior, and that is not logically correct or actually what your title is at the Chali Institute for Global Innovation and Growth. And she's also an assistant professor of economics at North Dakota State University. I am so psyched. Welcome. Thank you so much for having me, Juliet. So before we get started, what is the most important thing that people my age or in my generation should know that we don't? So, I mean, I've I was thinking about this a lot because I don't think that we're too far apart in age. I'm kind of on that millennial Zoomer line um, myself. So I've been thinking about things that maybe I should know or things I should work towards learning um, in life and and kind of just thinking about people like in my peer group um, as well. And uh, one of the things that I've thought about is that like growing up, a lot of us were told you know, if you love what you do, you'll never work a day in your life or you are kind of meant to just be like the most passionate about your career and love every single second of your work day. Um, otherwise, for, like it, it, to me, it kind of interpreted it. If you aren't 100 percent in love with what you do, it's some sort of failure or you aren't in the right line of work. Um, and that can be pretty panic inducing for, for people that maybe didn't have a dream of a career growing up. Um, you know, if you wanted to didn't know that you wanted to be a professor, like me, for example. Um, a lot of the time I was like, how am I ever going to be like happy and fulfilled in life if I don't have the like perfect career? Um, and thankfully I just kind of kept feeling my way through the dark and found that. But I, as I'm advising, uh, master's students and, and undergrads at NDSU, I've learned that a lot of students like feel similarly and they've had this like kind of, um, you know, feeling indecisive or fear of kind of taking that next step into a career because they're waiting for that holdout, like for that perfect job that feels right. Um, and I think that something um, that's important to know is that like you can feel fulfilled in, in, uh, in areas other than your career and that sometimes it takes a little while for things to fall into place. Um, and, you know, if you expect to be a happy a hundred percent of the time, like you're going to be let down. <laughs> so, um, and trying to find ways to you know, like let your mood not get too wrapped up in um, your career. So that's kind of my piece of advice maybe to myself and to to others, you know, younger than me. This is a really timely piece of advice. This is something I was actually thinking about this morning, um, something I was thinking about before the podcast, which is maybe why I'm a little frazzled. Um, <laughs> how did you, I guess you just felt your way around the dark, but what does that actually look like? Do you, is there... Mm, the better way to put this, what do you tell students you advise when they come to you with this sort of issue? Yeah. So I think like I started to, momentum was a big thing um, for me. I, I mean, for better or worse, I just kind of kept going to the next thing. And then eventually you find yourself in grad school somehow, sometimes. Um, mm -hmm. But also, um, you know, I, I kind of would let uh, like the feedback of like, did the, I taught a class that felt good, you know, in grad school, maybe I like being a teacher, you know, or you get positive feedback for something that you were doing and you're like, okay, maybe I'm actually pretty good at this. Cause I think that like, I was sort of searching for that like passion and it, it wasn't really quite there until I started, um, you know, you don't get a chance to do a lot of the things that are like your, your actual day-to-day -day work when you're in school, you know, like you don't get to, to, be a teacher when you're studying to, you know, studying education, for example, like it, it, until you kind of get to those like classroom experiences and that's really telling. So, um, sometimes it's hard to know what you're going to be, what you're going to like until you do it. Um, and that's kind of what I tell students. It's like, if you can get any experience or any kind of glimpse into what, like what you're thinking about would be like, that might be really telling. Cause you know, students that go to 
law school and then they start being a lawyer and they're like, I actually don't like this. Like that, that happens. And then you, they, they, they feel really lost. Um, and so one of the things I say is that like one, it's okay. And that you can find fulfillment in other, other areas of your life, but also, um, you know, on the front end, if I can get them an undergrad, I'm trying to get them as much experience as possible talking to people that have those careers, et cetera, um, about what it's like. Was there a moment when it clicked for you, when you realized that that's what you wanted to do or did it never, I don't know, like, does a specific moment come to mind when you just knew? Um, so, I mean, in full transparency, like I grew up, my, my father's a professor of economics, so I kind of was familiar with the career, but you don't really know everything, um, until you're, you're doing it, I guess. So, um, when I was in graduate school, I remember, um, having a student come to me, um, like on the first day of class and say, like, my friends recommended you, um, to, to take your class. And I think that's when I started to realize like, oh, like, you know, you don't get, you get, you get your teaching evaluations, but it's, it's, that's like a much more valuable piece of feedback for me, um, that like what I was doing was good. And also just thinking, um, you know, the, like certain students or certain classroom moments, I guess, moments in the classroom that, uh, made me feel like I was doing where I was supposed to be, you know, I I was where I was supposed to be. Um, that happened a lot in graduate school. And so, you know, of course that's quite a risk, you know, at that point you're in a PhD program and, and finally starting to feel like you've got your footing, but, um, I'm glad it happened when it did. Yeah. I I'm trying to figure out there, there's something larger than this conversation, but this conversation is a very important part of it. And I'm trying to figure out about what is the pressure that my generation and seems like you've felt some of this. What? Why is there this pressure? Why is there this narrative? Because I don't think it was entirely intentional that you must find the right and perfect work. Um, and you and on must the first be try. Yes. Weird. Yeah. And that's that's something that has like, I mean that's been kind of, and and then when you actually speak to adults that were giving that advice to us, like they maybe had multiple careers or, you know, they, maybe that, maybe that's why is that they, they wish that they had gotten it right on the first try. And so that was the advice. And also thinking like telling us that, you know, the passion and then, you know, being able to like really change the world and that everything that we do has to have like this massive impact and like gravity. That's a lot of pressure to put on, on, people, um, that like every single one of us has to change the world. I I don't necessarily dis, I mean, I agree, agree. It's important to kind of strive to make the world better than you found it, but I mean, it can, it can get out of control pretty quickly and be interpreted like with, with immense, (laughs) immense weight, you know? Yeah. Well, it's almost like taking someone's words out of context, right? If you're given this piece of advice or if you're told this story of, oh, I found the perfect career. Love of my life is my job. I have never felt more fulfilled than since I've started doing this. And you don't see kind of the process it took to get there. Maybe you walk away left with this impression that there is pressure, that it is possible to get it right on the first try. Whereas if you know that that's not the full story, then you can come at it a little more I don't know, realistically, or you walk away with with a fuller picture and a better understanding of, oh, well, we're all kind of similar. And again, no one has it figured out. There are certain things in life that you can't just pass down, like the right job for you is not something that can be passed down from generations above, I think. Exactly. Yeah. And I think that kind of when I first thought about how I wanted to answer this this question, you know, the like no one knows what they're doing is kind of the first, <laughs> um, that was the first thing that I think that young people should know is that like, um, cause I think that they'll, you know, you might see someone who's doing well or seems like they have it together and you go to them and you're like, how did you do it? And they go, I don't know. Like, that's like a really common response. And it's like, I think that's kind of the point is that like, no one really knows. And it's, it's kind of an individual, um, you know, journey. Um, and you can, all you can do is try to get as much information along the way. Um, to help you. Yeah. Lovely. Um, now I'm going to 
pivot a little bit. Start big, okay. get small. <laughs> cool. What what is economics? What does it mean to you? And how do you use it? Oh gosh, e- economics is everything. Um <laughs> it's it's everywhere. Um I think you know, if you want to like use the it's just decision making, right? But if everything is kind of coming from a decision, therefore it's everything. Um and and I try to get um in the classroom, especially, um, I feel like a lot of the, the term economics or like what economics is, um, people who aren't familiar with it have these priors going into their first economics course. And I like to um, kind of challenge that on the first day um, and ask them what, it, what like, you know, the first thing I have my students do is write down what they think economics is at the start of class. And then we have a class and then they write down a definition at the end of class. And it's, it's never the same. Um, you know, you usually get things like money and how the world, you know, how the world works or whatever. Um, and, and by the end they're like, it's, it's cooperation, it's decision-making, it's, um, it's just like human behavior. Um, that's how I view it. And, and so therefore I, I can't escape it. I, you know, I, I talk about how you can't get fulfilled in your job, but sometimes economists, like it's, it's not just a, um, it's not just a profession. It's like a, a personality trait to be an economist, I think. Yes, I think it is. Um, the reason why I ask this question is because I was at a dinner with some of my family members the other day and I got asked this question and I was fumbling over my words, could not. Yeah. I was like, it's a science of decision making, which is true, but that is so minimal. And we like efficiency and that's an efficient way of presenting it. But it's so much more than that or that when I say it doesn't convey all that I mean necessarily, mm-hmm. I think. Um, so, OK. What is the Kaya Lam project in South Africa? This is what I want to start to talk about, um, because I don't know, I was I was looking into some things before we did this. And this is one of the things I stumbled upon. And I think it's super duper interesting. So what what is this situation? How, what happened in South Africa that made the project necessary? What does the project do? Yeah, sure. So the Kaya Lam project, and Kaya Lam means my home, um, and um, it's run by the Free Market Foundation in South Africa, um, and they they do great work. Um, and this is one of their one of their projects. But um, this is one of those like remnants of apartheid in South Africa um, that fascinated me. Um, I studied abroad at University of Cape Town when I was an undergrad and um, try to write about South Africa whenever I can in my research, just because I think it's a fascinating place and a understudied um, in economics uh, based off of the kind of weird institutional things they have going on there. And one of those things is that um, written into the constitution um, the, you know, the new const- newer constitution, um, is that everyone has a right to, to housing. Um, but like I said, this, this remnant of apartheid, these government built houses, um, in the townships for non-whites, um, they were owned by, uh, the government, the built by the government, owned by the government and people were just renting or living in them, um, uh, you know, for free, I guess, um, and so the um the problem is when these people that have you know received these homes were forcibly moved from their <laughs> original places of living and then moved to these government built housing uh complexes when they when they die they aren't able to pass that um home on to their uh, children or grandchildren um and when these and these been in the family you know for decades um they these homes are not uh assets that people can use as collateral for loans so they're basically just like these kind of empty shells and in some cases people are still paying rent kind of like just perpetually to the government for these for these homes um and so it's it's kind of a bizarre thing right like that people are living in these homes um they have no legal claim to them but they have a right a legal right to to own and, and and own a home, and so the Kyle Land Project is kind of meant to bridge that gap. Um, the government has not been very uh, transparent in that uh, about how people can actually get these homes titles transferred into their name. Um, 
it's a legal process. It costs, you know, quite a bit of money uh, for the average South African. It's about like a month's salary. Um, and, you know, it's paperwork and just given the general distrust of banks and governments in South Africa, like people don't really go through this process um, voluntarily. So that's where Kyle Iam steps in and says like, hey, we'll handle all the paperwork. We'll handle all the lawyers and the banks and all that. And um, and the fees, um, the fees are funded through Kyle Iam, through donations. Um, and they, they transfer titles into individuals' names. So these people have been living in these homes, you know, 30, 40, 50 years. And, and now they finally are owners of these homes so they can make changes to the home for the first time legally and, um, and use it as a, as an asset, like for loans. So it's pretty transformative. Um, so what I like started first thinking about was just how, how this is going to completely change people's lives, um, for the better. And so they, they've done a pilot program in one, uh, municipality, and then have been slowly rolling it out all throughout the country. Um, and so that's one of the areas that I've been um, doing research in. Yeah. And what are some of the outcomes that we're seeing? What is the magnitude of change in these people's lives? What does it materially mean? Yeah. So, I mean, anecdotally, we see that people are able to build on top of, I mean, onto their homes, they make additions and and so on. The people are running businesses out of their homes now uh, because they've been able to maybe build a little room off the back and have a, a hair salon or a small shop or something like this. Um, also, uh, people are able to sell their homes and, and move uh, back to the cities because these townships were placed very inconveniently outside of the city so that, you know, people had to commute in for work um, and that the more desirable you know, uh, areas inside the city were reserved for, for whites. Um, so now that that's starting to change. And so that kind of those, like I said, these really sticky aspects of apartheid where you, people are literally unable to move. I mean, you'd have to just abandon the home if you wanted to leave. Now they can sell the home and they actually have a, a reason to leave these areas and, and come back to the city, which is massive. Um, and then also I find that this, this reduces crime. So there are a lot of different mechanisms that might explain this. One of the things is is moving, right? People might be moving from high crime areas to low crime areas. We also might see um, we might see the people being able to secure their homes for the first time. So if you can't legally make any um, changes to your home, if you aren't an owner, you could maybe add a, a wall or uh, you know a security system or fences or bars on the windows, plenty of other things that help prevent property crime specifically. So I find that after these municipalities increase home ownership, there is a decline in, in crime. And, and that can come from just, you know, people being able to more safely secure their homes. So this sort of policy has, uh, this is a question I've been dealing with a lot, especially since Oppenheimer, for whatever reason, watching Oppenheimer really made real to me the difference between playing around with theory and ideas and then actually putting things into practice and doing them. Um, mm -hmm. How do you balance doing, I mean, obviously you're studying what people are actually already doing on the ground, but how do you kind of reconcile or balance this idea that we can play around with theory and have an idea that, oh, well, if we try this and if we look at this, we might be able to learn some more about econ. We might learn more about what works, what doesn't, what's good for the world, whatever. Um, but something that also has policy implications. I feel like a lot of the time this is something I get asked to justify <laughs> on behalf of <laughs> all of economics is, well, aren't you just playing with something that's kind of made up and it actually has a real impact on someone's life? Um, and obviously in this case, it's a good thing, but it's still, I don't know. Some people might call it made up. <laughs> yeah. I think that one of the things that really like endeared me to the Kyle Ann project was they went in just being like everyone, you know, if you've been living in this home and it's your home, like you deserve to own it. And if you have the legal right to own it, 
let's get you that house basically. And that, that there was no kind of, and then it will do X, Y, and Z. It's, it's never been really any part of, of the project's kind of goal. So, um, and I just was curious to see, you know, I, I think it's a, a, good, a good thing, uh, for people to be able to own the home that they, they live in, um, and not be paying rent perpetually to the government. So I was like, this, you know, that sounds great, but I was like, there've got to be potentially, uh, some, some good things that can come from this. So, um, in that sense, yeah, they are kind of just playing around and, and experimenting, but the, I, I'm just kind of an outside observer taking advantage of their charitable work r- rather than, um, kind of, it, does that make sense? Yeah, it does. It does. So it kind of more sheds light on normatively what we could do in the future based on what mm-hmm. you economically are describing based on something that's happening regardless of economics almost. Right, right. So this wasn't like orchestrated by economists. Now, I mean, there are plenty of like RCT type things that are done that that people do to kind of, uh, you know, manipulate the world to see if things work, right? Like, I guess that's kind of a way to think about it. But, um, but I think that can be, I mean finding nothing can also be really valuable as well. So, um, yeah, I'm glad that in this case you don't find nothing. Uh, me too. (laughs) It's, it's, I don't know. It's good is what it is really. Um, Mm -hmm. because what I think about when I think about South Africa, especially now I learned about apartheid a few years ago in high school. And now when I, now my most recent memory of this is watching videos. People would send me videos of just like almost, I don't know if it's like drone footage of the divide in housing in South Africa. And you can see very clearly what the lines are and how property is different um, between places that used to be separated and now are still separated, but not legally. Right. And that's like where this kind of that, like some of it still is, you know, it's not directly caused by policy, but this, this way that it's very difficult to move out of the township, you know, makes it so that these, these divides persist, you know? Yeah. So it's good all around. Yes. What can we learn from it to bring home? So, I mean, in particular, just remembering the importance of property rights, there's a lot of good research done in the U.S. about homeownership and and crime. Um, And, you know, but there's also a lot that's being done now about um, reservations and the importance of homeownership, um, you know, in in Native American reservations and being in North Dakota, this is a a very much like relevant um, to our to our region um, sort of topic. And so you know, there's a lot that can be kind of extracted from a South African type, um, you know, institutional setting that we can think about where people are placed in a, in a, in an area that isn't, you know, um, either moved somewhere and they aren't afforded property rights. This is, um, very relevant to the U S. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. So you also do work relating to women and economic freedom. What is the state of economic freedom for women at home in America and also globally around the world? How is it different in different places? So this, this is a, this is a good question. So economic freedom for women in the United States, I'll start there. Um, on a legal basis, um, we have, women have the same, um, you know, economic freedoms under the law as men. Um, and, you know, anything beyond like the, uh, the, the policy and legal stuff, it's, it's kind of difficult to observe. Um, but, uh, in terms of around the world, there are some pretty stark disparities between, um, economic freedom for men and for women. And so, uh, this work, uh, is motivated, all the work that I'm doing in this, this area is motivated by, um, an index called the gender disparity index, which is kind of housed under the Fraser Institute that also, uh, puts out the Economic Freedom of the World report. Um, and so the Gender Disparity Index is uh, authored by Rosemary Fike at, at Texas Christian. And um, and so she's looking at 17 kind of questions 
that um, that measure whether or not economic freedom for women is the same as it is for men. Um, it has nothing to do with the overall level of economic freedom. It's just like the equity between uh, the genders. And, and so um, this kind of recent set of research that I'm working on and others are working on is not just looking at like what overall economic freedom does for women outcomes or female outcomes, um, but also just that equity between uh, the economic freedoms um, and how that affects like outcomes for, for both men and women. Um, and so there are about 40, 42, depending on the year, countries that uh, have unequal uh, economic freedom between men and women. Um, and it seems like the general trend is to that economic freedom for women has been increasing, but there are still some countries that actually have restricted economic freedom, like in the last couple of years uh, for women, uh, like preventing their ability to work in dangerous jobs at night, um, holding passports, traveling without, um, traveling outside of the country, things like this. So, okay, maybe I'm a little, I don't want to say confused, but maybe confused is just the right word and it's just very blunt towards myself. Um, So when we talk about the state of economic freedom and then the equity of economic freedom, am I saying this right? Yeah. What is the difference? Are they one and the same? What does it help to look at equity specifically? And what does that actually practically mean in terms of measurements? Definitely. So the economic freedom, like overall, is kind of on a is on a scale from one to 10. That's how we measure it. Um, it's a bunch of different variables, like, uh, split into many categories and compiled into like a score and where one is virtually no economic freedom and 10 it being the highest level of economic freedom. And, and so in general, people are finding that higher levels of economic freedom correspond with, you know, longer life expectancy for women, higher, like more education for women. Um, you know, they have, they're more likely to own a bank, have a bank account, like things like this female entrepreneurship is higher. Um, fertility rates are lower, so on and so forth. Like basically higher economic freedom. You see good outcomes for, for women and, and for men as well. And, but we're going to be talking about women for right now. And then the gender disparity index comes in and says, well, there are some laws that allow economic freedom for men, but not for women. And before the economic freedom index overall wasn't accounting for that. So in 2015, um, they, they adjusted area two, which is the legal system and property rights area of the economic freedom index to adjust for this gender disparity. Um, and so, you know, a country that has say a seven out of 10, but unequal, uh, treatment between men and women. And then we have a country that maybe has like a five out of 10, but equal treatment of men and women in economic freedom. Like those kinds of nuances is what uh, this research is getting at now. Does that help clarify? Yeah. Yeah, it does. Um, So I guess bringing it back to men, not that we always have to do that, but you mentioned it and I was thinking about going there anyways. Um, (laughs) Why should men care about this? How does it help men? Yeah. So, I mean, what I've found um, in some of the more recent stuff that I'm working on is that increasing the gender disparity index score, meaning that men and women are treated more equally, actually ha- has benefits for all members of the society, not just for women. Um, and there are a lot of possible explanations for this. But, you know, you could think of that if women are able to work outside the home and participate in like, you know, um, informal business kind of, uh, behavior, they are able to contribute to the household income, uh, which we know has good, uh, impacts for everybody. The children can go to school. Um, this is, we're showing this time and time again, that increasing economic freedom for women, the children go to school more, um, at a higher rate and they stay in school longer. Um, and this of course would be great for, for sons and daughters. Um, and, um, you know, that people are living longer, they're healthier. And th- these kinds of things, this isn't just a, a female specific outcome, right? Like if, uh, if women are doing well, everyone would be, who should be doing well. It's kind of, is kind of the argument that I make. And so you mentioned that fertility rates are lower and I know especially some conservatives or even people who are just worried about population 
uh, sustainability. I mean, not sustainability of the earth, but sustainability of the country. Uh, two different types of sustainability here. Um, that might kind of be a negative. Like, why would we give women economic freedom if we have fewer children? Or how how is that good for the family? Um, so it's good in terms of school outcomes, but I don't know. Can you can you put a good yeah, spin on a, that? That's a great question. Yeah. So um, a lot of this research, the the paper that I did about economic freedom for women and fertility, um, was motivated by a colloquium that was put on by the Bridwell Institute at SMU. Um, they the Bridwell Institute for Economic Freedom. Um, they they put on a colloquium with um, gosh, a couple dozen papers, uh, all focused on economic freedom for women. So I'm going to borrow from some results from other people's papers as well as my own. But um, my my paper uh, finds that you know more economic freedom means lower fertility rates, lower birth rates. Um, so the number of children per woman, but also the number of births overall, and then also adolescent fertility rates. Um, this in general, in the development literature, like a uh, decline in fertility rates is seen as like a, is a, a good thing, a normatively good thing. Um, but there are concerns about like decline, like women having fewer children, um, that you kind of have to balance that. So we have some areas where, um, how do I want to put this? There are some countries that, um, with benefit from having lower fertility rates for a variety of reasons. So like, it's kind of this, uh, complicated, nuanced argument that I have to, to make. But one of the things that really struck me was there's a, there's a, the wanted fertility rate. Um, so this is like the, the number of children that women desire to have, and then whether or not that actually matches the number of children that they do have. Um, and that's a measure that we have at the U S level. And so, um, a paper by uh, piano and stone, in this group of papers finds that, um, when women have more economic freedom or when there's more economic freedom in the United States, um, that women are like that gap between the wanted number of children and the actual number of children shrinks. Um, and so that means that like the desired number of children is the number of children that people are having, like more getting closer to that, um, which I think of as a, as a good thing. Um, but also, um, in the same way that this literature kind of builds on the, uh, a bunch of papers that talk about, um, income and fertility that suggest that if incomes increase, fertility goes down. Um, I don't think that anyone would suggest that the way to have more children is to cut incomes. You know what I mean? I, mm -hmm. I think that I, and so in the same way, I'm going to argue that like, if we want women to have more children or we want there to be more children, we shouldn't necessarily d discourage economic freedom. Um, there are plenty of other ways to, you know, make having children more attractive. Um, but overall, um, still in the developing world, declining fertility rates are a sign of, of, of progress and development. Yeah. And so I'm wondering if also... If if you thought of looking at this or if there's any if you know anything about this, but looking at total investment in children, obviously, mm. like you'd have to account for how much it costs and all of the inflation and all of that. But I would think if there are fewer children and if you actually want to have them. Right. So if that if that measure is actually shrinking, if that distance is shrinking, then you will be more willing per child to invest. And also, if the total level of investment doesn't really change or increases, then that's better for each child. I, I think that's a great point. I haven't specifically looked at that, but, and I don't know if anyone has, that's one of the things that's really struck me in, in working on this. Um, and I'm really grateful to all the other papers that are, that, are, that were in that colloquium as well, but um, really hasn't been a lot of work done on economic freedom for women and its effects. Um, part of that is just a function of the fact that the gender disparity index is relatively new and maybe it, and, and I know I'm not going to speculate on other reasons why, but I'm, I'm happy to be working in this area because there's just like a lot of really interesting questions that are honestly low hanging fruit that are sitting right there that like, 
and have really obvious policy implications, you know, so like allowing women to have bank accounts or own property or open a business on their own, like what are the impacts of that um, around the world? I I would suspect that people probably would invest more in their children if they were having the desired number of children and and fewer children, right? Um, because um, even with just, there are more resources, right, to to go go around. Yeah. Um, so I guess part of me I want to ask what attracted you to this. But then on the other hand, and I'm going to ask this, this the ask this at the same time, even though it's an entirely different question. What are some of the barriers to entry you're seeing in terms of minimizing gender disparities in terms of economic freedom and all of that? Um, and I guess what can be done about it? That was a whole bunch of questions. <laughs> so I'll start with the the first question, what got me into this. I just write about what interests me. So, I mean, my, my CV is kind of all over the place, um, but that's okay because I... I I'm a relatively scatterbrained person. So I, I like to have multiple kinds of like papers going on in my brain. I couldn't possibly write about the same topic all the time. I would go crazy. So it's nice to have stuff going on in South Africa in one part of my brain and then be thinking about women's economic freedom in another part of my brain. Um, but I, obviously the women in economic freedom thing interests me because I am a woman probably at its core, but also, um, because you can, you can very easily see the, um, the policies that you can, um, that you can apply and the, and the impacts of those policies. Right. So like, I, I really, I, I, I enjoy that, um, part of the research as well. Um, so, you know, like these questions are very like, yes or no. And so the, when you change the answer from, from no to yes, basically, can a woman get a job the same way as a man? If that switches from no to yes, and we see positive effects, well, then we kind of can very easily sell what, what policy should be, you know, prescribed. Right. Um, and so that's, um, a really gratifying part of this type of research. Cause sometimes when you write a paper, you're like, I found this effect, but I don't really know what the solution is. Um, and that can, can be frustrating or difficult to, to sell its importance. Right. Yeah. Um, and in terms of barriers to, to economic freedom for women, um, you know, that's, that, that's tough because obviously a lot of this is tied to culture and I've been, I've received feedback and, and, and maybe pushback, uh, from when I've presented this work about, um, yeah, we can change the laws, but if, you know, culture doesn't change, like, or does, does it actually change the behavior? You know, uh, if, if women are allowed to work at night or work in an industrial job, do they actually start doing that? Um, and that's really difficult to observe, um, at least immediately. Um, so culture kind of, or just norms can, uh, can counteract these policies. I would, I would suspect, um, yeah. And and then also some of the arguments have been made for like safety. So like whether or not women can work in dangerous jobs and things like this, but, uh, I, I don't, I don't really buy that. Yeah. I mean, I feel like economics kind of tells you that the woman or individual in question should know or would know or will find out if they're <laughs> well suited for that job. So, right. I don't know. At least I tend to kind of just not roll my eyes, but raise an eyebrow maybe at that type of argument. I'm, I'm totally. wondering what you think in terms of cultural norms. Um, Don Boudreau at GMU, I've interviewed him a few times, listeners, go check it out. Um, and I, he told me once that there's a difference between legislation and law, right? So in terms of policy and the rules on the books, that's legislation. But then there's law, which is the institutions. It's not just the legislation, but it's actually the way that the rules are followed. And it's the unspoken or unwritten rules. Uh, so it's more than just policy, right? It's the norm that maybe even if you got rid of this barrier to entry into industrial jobs for women, that they wouldn't because of culture. Um, and so I guess, how would you even go about measuring that? And 
if you had a hypothesis that this wasn't actually, it, it wasn't just the legislation, it is the norm, how, do you, how would you figure that out? And do you buy this distinction between the two? I certainly buy the distinction between the two. And, and I, I don't, in terms of measurement though, it's, that's just, that's just part of the the job in my opinion is it's, mm-hmm. har- it's hard to distinguish. Um, and, and I never, uh, expect the research to go like to be perfect. Right. Um, yeah. but I do think that it's getting at something that's still really important and valuable. So like, I mean, laws on the books and the institutions, I think are still connected to one another, right? Like the, these laws in the books didn't come they came from something and they were motivated by something. So, I mean, if you really were skeptical of say a country changing one of these, these policies around women, we might take a deeper dive into how that policy change came to be, you know, whether there was pressure to like where the pressure to change that law came from. Right. Mm. Um, and that, that might be more helpful for us to understand how effective that law change will be in terms of like actual action. So if it's coming from some sort of like, you need to have this law in order to join some international group or get some sort of, you know, get money or whatever it is from the international community versus this is something that the people in our country want. Um, I think that probably will determine like the uptick, uptick in, in women's economic participation. Um, so uh, that's something that can be done, but it's really difficult to piece that out, like on an, on a, like when I'm doing these cross country studies. Right. Um, so I just, you know, usually say some sort of classic academic throwaway thing where it's like, well, it's just, you know, downward bias results, la da 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 da. But, uh, I, I do, I do take it seriously and think about it. Um, you know, maybe if you were going to do a deep dive into, you know, a region or a set of countries, um, that have made changes recently, that would be good. Yeah. And so one more question before the final question. Um, you, you said that you, it's good for your brain that you have multiple different areas of interest when you study econ and when you actually do research, they seem to all be tied together though. Kind of the, the rules of the game, I guess maybe that's just econ is how do people, how do people behave in terms of rules of the game, formal or informal? Um, but I guess it's also the study of how the rules are made. Yeah, now I'm just thinking out loud. But I guess, is there a central theme of all the work you do? And what what do you think that that has taught you about um, studying econ or how how to find what you like? And what has it taught you to be optimistic about the world we live in? Yeah, I think... I've done that, that what you just said is I've said that to myself so many times being like, what do you actually study? Like, is it just economics at the end of the day? But, um, I think a lot of it has to do with like the importance of, um, importance of individuals to be able to, you know, make choices about their daily lives, their businesses, their property, um, and, and the, you know, I like to think about paper outcomes that, you know, improve individual well-being. So that's the kind of, the kind of topics that excite me. So, um, and usually that comes with, you know, expanding freedoms, economic freedoms, mostly, um, in what I study. But, um, so I think that's kind of the section of economics that I like to spend my time in is if we, you know, remove this barrier or if we, um, you know, permit this sort of behavior, like how does this improve people's lives? Um, and, and that's kind of usually how I set out in a research project. Cause I like to focus on the, on the positive, <laughs> but if these thoughts are going to consume me all day long, um, mm-hmm. you know, it's not really the kind of thing that I can just shut off. So, um, I, I like to think about how, how things can be better for people. Yeah. That's awesome. Oh, that's inspiring also. All right. So I have one last question for you. Thank you so much for taking the time to come on the podcast and for sharing all your wisdom and everything oh, that you. you've learned. Um, what is one thing that you believed at one time in your life that you later changed your position on and why? Okay. So this one is a tough one. Um, so I think that 
I used to more firmly believe in the kind of, it's not bad advice, but you know, when people say like, if this, if this thing is toxic or it, you know, I don't know, whatever word you want to use, it doesn't serve you or it doesn't spark joy like Marie Kondo, then you should just remove it from your, from your life. Um, and for a a good part of my like early to mid twenties, I was, I was Marie Kondoing my life like pretty hard. Like if it didn't spark joy, I got rid of it. Um, and that can, I've, I've found that that can be kind of, it can be good, but it also can be kind of dangerous. We, live in a world where it can be very easily to like curate your, your whole life to be comfy, cozy all the time, like from your home to your phone algorithm, to the people you hang out with and everything like that, you could basically make it like feel good all the time. Um, and, and then you don't, there's no growth. Um, and so I've been trying to make myself uncomfortable more often. Um, and I think that that's something that, um, was, is scary, but it's, it's for the, for the most part, good. Um, so that's kind of the thing I've changed my position on is it, I don't have to be comfy all the time. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I guess like, this is maybe a weird question, but I guess like, what are some practical ways that you do that? Cause it sounds so nebulous and large and like positive, yeah. but also how on earth do you do that? So I, I've read things that I disagree with. I try to talk to people that I wouldn't normally talk to. I, I mean, in terms of tra- traveling to places that scare you, um, or you wouldn't normally go to, um, it's little things like that, or, I mean, those can be quite big things actually, but, um, things like that, just putting yourself a little bit out of your comfort zone, saying yes to things that you wouldn't normally say yes to, um, or, or saying no to things that you would normally, um, wouldn't normally say no to, um, can be, that's when I have found I've gotten some, um, like I've some moments where like, oh my gosh, I wouldn't have done that five years ago, two years ago. I wouldn't have said yes to this podcast <laughs> um, two years ago. Like I am a pretty shy person actually. So this um, this is one of those things that's like, you just got to do things that put you a little bit out of your comfort zone. Ah, oh, well, I'm glad you're here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, me too. Once again, I'd like to thank my guests for their time and insight. I'd also like to thank you for listening to The Great Antidote podcast. It means a lot. The Great Antidote is sound engineered by Rich Goyette. If you have any questions, any guests, or topic recommendations, please feel free to reach out to me at greatantidote at libertyfund.org. Thank you.